Okay, so back to the uh, strategies. A couple other things. Uh, we do power power projection, and, and uh, there's a number of different ways that we're capable of doing that. And by power projection, we mean uh, supporting troops on the ground. Uh, obviously, the air wing is capable of uh, projecting power uh, at a good long distance, but so are surface ships. And can we go to the the strike group slide? This is kind of who we are in terms of capability. And the upper left-hand corner is our frigate. Uh, we have one frigate. They're, they're a little bit long in the tooth as, as far as ships go. Uh, and they're being replaced by littoral combat ships, which, are, which is a new class of ship we're bringing on the line that's going to be a little bit more versatile, a little bit smaller so it can operate in shallower water. But this is, this is not a very big ship. It's only got about, actually, a little under 200 people. I think they're about 175, 176 right now going up to about 195 because we maybe don't have quite enough. But it's a very good anti-submarine warfare platform. It's good at finding submarines. It's also the kind of ship you might want to send up into the northern Arabian Gulf uh, because the water is fairly shallow and it can provide a you know gray ship combat presence uh, for the folks around the oil platforms that might want to do harm to the oil platforms. It provides them with a look that, uh, that deters them from doing so. The two ships on the right, up and down, the top ship is a guided missile destroyer. We have a couple of those. Uh, the bottom ship is a cruiser. We have one with us. We actually have three in the strike group, but only one's come with us. Uh, they're both capable of really doing the whole range of missions uh, that, uh, that we would want ships to be able to do. So it's uh, anti-air warfare, anti-surface, anti-submarine warfare, uh, as well as power projection. They are capable of power projection through launch and Tomahawk land attack missiles. And if you remember, in particular during uh, uh, the, uh, the Gulf War, we launched about 800 and some odd cruise missiles to sort of start things off. A lot of those came from ships or submarines. Uh, and that's not a, not a very well known fact. In fact, the vast majority of them came from the Navy. Uh, the Air Force has the capability to launch air launch cruise missiles, which once they're underway function much the same way. But, but we've got destroyers that can reach out, you know, hundreds of miles uh, and, uh, and touch, you know, the northeast corner of a building if that's what we want it to touch. Uh, very accurate weapon systems. Uh, and so each of those ships will carry a mixture of surface-to-surface uh, -surface missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and uh, land attack missiles as well, as well as uh, uh, torpedoes in order to prosecute the, the subsurface war. So inevitably people want to ask the question I always, always did anyway, you know, okay, we have cruisers that can do this mission and we have destroyers that can do the same mission. Why do you have two different kinds of ships? Uh, the cruisers were built, uh, they were really built to be Cold War machines. Uh, they have an enormous capacity to defend the carrier uh, against uh, large raids of Soviet aircraft. So now we don't have large raids of Soviet aircraft. We don't even have Soviet aircraft anymore. So they've been adapted over time to, to perform a variety of missions. So they can defend the carrier quite well uh, against any potential threat, but they can also do a number of other missions uh, as well. The destroyers are a little bit newer. Uh, I think they're a little bit faster. We don't have a destroyer guy with us. They'll tell you they're faster. Anyway, they won't necessarily <laughs> tell you the truth. But, uh, I think they are a little bit faster. Uh, but they're also smaller. They carry fewer weapons, uh, and they have fewer watch standards, so they're not quite as capable of you know, handling a large size raid. But, but that's okay, because we don't have large size raids anymore. So we've got a couple ships uh, that are very capable, uh, both operating with the strike group in, you know, in concert. And if you, if you looked around when you're up in the flight deck, and I know it's hard to stop looking at the airplanes, but we have, we have this ring of steel around us so that we don't get sunk. And I know you'll all appreciate not getting sunk tonight, so we'll, we'll try to make sure. But we can also send them out on our own. Yes, sir. Now, do you have subs with you? Uh, that's a great question, and the short answer is no. Uh, and we actually don't have a submarine that's on our side. There are two submarines that are U.S. submarines that are playing uh, the enemy sub, and there are two of them are playing, I think, 27 enemy submarines, so we keep sinking them. <laughs> um, but until you sink all 27, that's, you know, you don't, you're not done with it. But the, our submarines are really controlled, not by the strike group. They're, they're theater assets, so the fleet commander, in conjunction with, with higher authority, will, will manage the submarine uh, force for us. And most of that's done um, I wouldn't say entirely without our knowledge, but 
without our having to do anything. And so as we sail into, into areas, in particular if we sail someplace where we perceive uh, the potential to run up against submarines from a different country uh, is higher, uh, there's, there's confidence uh, that we have that uh, we have submarines that are looking for their submarines. That's the best way to find a submarine is with another submarine. You don't know that? Uh, we'll get the information. And so we don't have to manage how that's done. It's all done at a at a, at a much higher uh, level because they look at they they look at a theater, and they look at the assets that are available, and then they'll they'll apply those assets as, as needed. And we've tried it a couple different ways over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, including having submarines uh, directly attached to the strike group. Uh, the problem with that is we don't have a lot of submarines, and because we don't have a lot of submarines, we don't have a lot of submarine officers. And so I have two submarine officers on my staff. And uh, you know, submarine warfare is very different than any other kind of, of warfare. And to really understand it, you have to be a submarine. So we have to rely on that expertise. Well, if you only have one or two folks, it's very hard for somebody like myself to manage that, you know, those assets in the right way. And so we found from a theater standpoint, uh, it's, a, it's a much better way to manage. Is there much of a submarine threat, like much of a Navy threat? Um, I, uh, sure. Um, you know, there's lots of countries that uh, that either build or have uh, diesel submarines. There aren't very many countries that have uh, have the kind of capable. In fact, no one has the uh, submarine force with the capabilities that we have. Uh, you know, a fairly good size. When I say we don't have a lot, uh, you know, sort of compared to what. Uh, might be the way to, to look at it, but we have a, you know, we have a, a robust <coughs> nuclear fleet of both attack submarines and ballistic missile submarines uh, that range the oceans of the world. Uh, not very many countries have that. The, the Russians uh, had it, and uh, you know they've emerged over the last couple of years uh, with with greater capability and, and, a, and a willingness. If you, you know, that was in the paper here last week. Uh, they've got a couple of nuclear-powered submarines <coughs> off our east coast. Now, they used that used to be standard. I mean, they they always had something. Uh, and, and so, you know, they haven't been then off the coast in quite some time. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, the Russians trying to emerge uh, post-Soviet uh, Union uh, and now post-oil uh, boom uh, in order to build a, a, a Navy that is, again, as capable as the Navy they had you know, toward the end of the Cold War. Uh, the Chinese are certainly emerging as a, as a military threat, and it's across the board. Uh, in terms of their capability, I, I shouldn't say military threat. As a military power, uh, is, is a more accurate because it doesn't have to be a threat. Um, but but they are modernizing their forces, including their submarine force, and they're growing their forces at the same time. Uh, that is potentially a good thing for the United States, as long as we share common interests, and then we work together toward those common interests. So, you know, if, if you're China, and you know, 80% of what is at Walmart spent time on a ship. You know, 90% of it came from China. And so if you're China, you benefit from a secure and stable maritime environment. Uh, and so there is common ground where we can we can cooperate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not all of the countries that are around China, and particularly the countries that border the South China Seas, view an emerging Chinese military force as a plus. Uh, so if you're Vietnam, or you're Indonesia, or you're the Philippines, you might have a different viewpoint of a more robust Chinese military, including their submarines. Uh, so, you know that that's a chapter that's yet to be written, and you know we'll see how it pans out over time. But it it could be an enormously.